I've lived in the remote sticks for most of my life, and for astrophotography, it has its pros and cons. The cons, frankly, are that I'll never find an astrophotography store nearby. Everything has to be ordered in, and if something has to be fixed, I have to order in that equipment too, or send my own equipment out. But when the sun goes down and the sky promises to clear up through the evening, and I look at that beautiful border one sky, I know exactly why this is the perfect place for astrophotography. And on this spring night's clear skies, we're going to go after two targets at the same time, the salt and pepper star cluster and the unforgettably beautiful bubble nebula. Now we've had several clear nights in a row and the telescope is already set up. I have the dew heaters going on the main scope and the guiding scope. And while they get the lenses warmed up, I'm going to head on into the cottage, fire up Nina and PhD2 and get the system ready to go for the evening. It's amazing how complex it can be to get one of these modern telescopes and mounts going. It can be almost like flying an aircraft. They are very capable, but we'll call it piloting. Piloting them takes finesse and familiarity. Now I selected tonight's targets yesterday and in Nina I simply typed in the catalog designation for the bubble nebula, NGC 7635, and used the transit graph to ensure it would be up during the hours that worked for me. One disadvantage of living in the north is as we move into summer, the nights become very short. Presently, we have only 6.5 hours of astronomical darkness. To squeeze out a little bit more filming time, I have a dual band filter in front of the camera. This gets rid of some of the light noise that we would get from moonlight, city lights, which is not really applicable out here, and also the last light of the day or the first light of the morning. Light filters on a monochrome camera would be much more powerful and give me a lot more time for shooting. But a cooled monochrome camera is an expense that will probably have to wait till perhaps winter. Now the salt and pepper star cluster is right beside the bubble nebula. I've already pre-programmed my telescope's focal length and the dimensions of my camera's sensor into NINA. It can take that information and tell me the field of view through the telescope. That field of view is visible in the rectangle just center right of the screen. And I've used the rotation bar on the left to rotate that field of view to ensure that I can get both the bubble nebula and the salt and pepper star cluster into the field that I want. This not only tells me what these two structures will look like when I am observing them through the telescope, but when the skies grow darker and the telescope is capable of guiding, I can use Nina's plate solving feature to have it turn the mount to face the telescope directly at these two structures and exactly within the framing specifications that I have set here. But there's still too much light in the sky for both the guide and the main scope. So all we can do is be patient a few minutes longer. It'll get dark soon enough. You may have noticed the telescope move a small bit just there. The main scope was able to plate solve. Now I can go ahead and get it ready for filming for the rest of the evening by having the scope go ahead and align on the bubble nebula and the salt and pepper star cluster. The main scope can actually effectively plate solve much sooner than the guide scope can start guiding. And this is because of that very nice duo band filter on the main scope that allows me to shoot images before full dark and during nights of the full moon. If you're wondering where I am, the answer is nowhere nearby. I'm in my lab slash observatory in the cottage about 50 meters away, controlling the telescope comfortably from my desk and main computer where I have wireless control through an application called Remote Desktop of the mini PC that's attached to the mount. Well, more correctly, it's attached to the tripod below the mount. I don't like weighing down my telescope with accessories, especially since Nova Scotia is often subjected to night winds. So weird as this might sound, but when I create a telescope rig, I have to think about aerodynamics. I want as little wind resistance on the top of the mount as possible. So pretty much everything but the scope and the guide scope, if that particular telescope has a guide scope rather than an off-axis guider, goes on or underneath the tripod. One of these days I'll detail how I quickly and conveniently do that setup and manage it in such a way that there's virtually no risk of wires ever becoming entangled. But here's a quick hint. With my refractor, the Xenostar 81mm, I've pre-run cords to all the attachments they are snugged up against the OTA's body with Velcro straps, and then they're guided down the tripod's body with smaller Velcro straps. This ensures that they are long enough for when the scope has to make any maneuver, including the dreaded meridian flip, and keeps an absolute minimum of weight and drag on top of the mount. 
and I can control the telescope from so far away by using a series of three wireless signal boosters. These are designed to boost and spread a wireless signal around a large home. In my case, I've picked signal boosters that'll run a focus signal between each other, and then I run them in a row, pretty much from my lab, out to about, oh, 10 meters from the telescope, where the mini PC can pick up the signal clearly. And that gives me full wireless remote control of the telescope through the night. All right, I'm going to go ahead and shoot a test image now. We're looking for an image where there isn't much visual noise. When that happens, I'm going to go ahead and run Nina's autofocus feature. The scope is pretty much in focus now, but autofocus will make it exact, which is really important because Nina will pretty much refuse to plate solve or three point polar align if it's even slightly out of focus. We're almost there, but there's still a little too much light coming out of the West. We'll wait a few more minutes. We are pretty much at that point now where you can see it getting darker minute to minute. But in the cottage, I have just enough time to make myself a cup of tea and get comfortably settled in because while Nina will pretty much automate everything for you, the autofocusing, the plate solving, and the shooting everything, as I said in a previous video, I'm a huge believer in Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong at will, and I find especially if you're not watching it. So I like to keep an eye on the telescope for the first couple hours while it's shooting, and then I'll set an alarm and wake up every two hours through the night and double check things. And I will also absolutely every time manually run the autofocus routines as well as the plate solving because they fail at times for various reasons. And if they fail and you aren't there to do something about it, your telescope isn't accomplishing anything. And where I live, clear nights are rare enough. I'm not willing to waste one to spend a few extra hours in bed. All right, there's still a little residual light in the sky, but it seems to be clear enough that we are ready to run an autofocus routine. We're seeing a nice bell curve happening, so I think this autofocus routine is going to be a success. Once the autofocus is done, we'll turn our attention to PHD2. PHD and the fast guide scope, without a filter in front of it, are even more sensitive to atmospheric light. So of all the things to set up in advance, it's pretty much the last. And yep, the autofocus routine was a success. It's moving the autofocuser to position 5781. I find that by the time the autofocus is able to do its job, it's only a few minutes until PHD2 can start guiding reliably. And I'll start shooting almost as soon as the mount is guiding. Before I even mess with PHD2 though, I'm going to run a test plate solve through Nina. If there's still too much light in the sky for Nina to plate solve, PHD2 is probably not going to function reliably, or at least sufficiently accurately. And besides, if the telescope can't properly plate solve, and we cannot get a precise position on our target, then this whole exercise is simply academic, isn't it? You can see on the right I've already tried to plate solve five times this evening without success, but the sixth time was the charm. I'm just going to run another test plate solve to make sure that it's a consistent charm. And yep it is. It's time to move on to PHD and get it guiding. We'll start by adjusting the guiding camera's exposure time and then setting it to give us a looping exposure. We want the exposure to be long enough that we can see stars clearly without an excess of noise. There's still a little too much light in the sky and the image is a little noisy, but at a shutter speed of 0.5 seconds, we have good clarity of stars and I think we can begin guiding now. And shutter speed is important for good guiding. Now in the old days of single star guiding, you wanted your guide cam shutter speed between two and five seconds. And by the old days, I mean just a couple years ago when the only form of guiding with PHD2 that was available was single star guiding. Spacing out the exposure somewhat like that helped PHD2 create good averages so the mount wasn't chasing minor aberrations in the atmosphere that created apparent differences in the position of the guide stars all the time. If you're unfamiliar with how guiding works, that uh, it probably sounds like Greek. We'll come back to it in a future video on how guiding, and in particular, how PHD2 works. But these days, PHD2 offers multi-star guiding, and unless you're using an off-axis guider at a high focal length, you should be using multi-star guiding. With multi-star guiding, you're much better off with a faster, a much faster exposure time. By going by the old standard, two seconds per exposure, I find my Skywatcher EQ6R telescope mount was giving me an error of about 1.6 arc seconds. That's an average number, but about 1.6 was pretty steady. But with multi-star guiding and moving the guide camera's exposure time up to 0.5 seconds, the guiding error dropped to an average of one second error. That's about a 40% improvement, which is significant. 
And despite the fast shutter speed, PHD2 won't chase the seeing in multi-star guiding, like it would have done in the old days with single star guiding. So just a simple note there, if using multi-star guiding, use a faster shutter speed, 0.5 seconds seems to work pretty well. With PHD guiding now, we're going to go back into Nina, pop over into the framing page, and have Nina once again slew and center on our two targets. And this is because even though the mount will do a pretty good job of sidereal tracking of the stars, even when it's not being guided, some error will still drift into the composition. So we're going to let Nina go ahead and plate solve, slew and correct, and get the composition back exactly where we wanted it. Remember in photography and videography, the composition is often just as important as the target. The composition contributes greatly in creating interest. So Nina has plate solved and corrected, and theoretically, our composition should now be exactly where we want it. So what I'm going to do now is just shoot an image of our targets and make sure the visual that I'm seeing lines up with what Nina is expecting. And if all is good, we'll begin our photographic sequence. Uh, I seem to have hit a wrong button in there somewhere. 8 minutes and 40 seconds is not a test shot. Let's just change that out for something more reasonable, the 20 seconds I originally intended. With the image stretched out, we can now see both the Bubble Nebula and the salt and pepper Star Cluster. They're a little more off-center in the frame than I had wanted. This is why it's important to run a test shot and not just rely 100% on Nina. Nina does a really good job, but it doesn't always calculate things the way that you expect, or vice versa. So sometimes you just have to make some manual changes. So I'm going to pop back in framing and just readjust where I want the targets to reappear within the space of the camera sensor. Once I have that just like I want, I'll hit slew and center. And it will slew, plate solve, correct as necessary, and then we'll do another test shot. This is so much better than the old days where you had to use one of those ridiculous hand controllers from the 80s or a game controller and very slowly try to move your telescope to face a target. I don't know if you've ever tried to steer an equatorial mount with a hand controller or keyboard controller, but it is the opposite of intuitive. I love Nina's ability to slew efficiently and quickly. Notice how our tracking dropped off temporarily while we we're slewing. PHD2 is supposed to do that. It'll resume automatically once the mount settles. Now we'll run another test exposure, this time 30 seconds, and confirm that we have the composition just where we want it in the frame. The photo is completed, debayered, and stretched. And the composition's looking pretty good now. I think we can work with this. So now we're going to pop over into the sequencer. I mentioned in the last video on astrophotography that I didn't like Nina's sequencer. What I was referring to was the advanced sequencer. I don't like it. I don't trust all the automation. But I do like the legacy sequencer, the old original sequencer. Whoever develops Nina, please do not drop that one out of Nina in favor of the advanced sequencer. I know I'm not alone in this. I don't like it. Too many things can go wrong when Nina's unattended. I don't want to have to control Nina by dropping in these little subroutines of programming here and there. Please don't ever remove the legacy sequencer. And on top of that, please continue to develop it. Personally, I think the legacy sequencer is one of the great features of Nina. It is one of the fastest and most effective ways I know of to get an imaging program to do absolutely everything you want the camera to do. A few clicks, the camera's configured, dithering is configured, autofocus conf is configured, everything is configured and ready to go. The legacy sequencer is wonderful. I'd take it a hundred times over the advanced sequencer. All right, enough of that. Looking over the sequencer, everything looks good. 70 exposures of 300 seconds, no binning, and dithering every four frames. I have Nina set to tell PHD2 to dither by 12 pixels every four frames. In another video, we'll study dithering, what it is, how it works, and how to use Nina to control PHD2's dithering. It's really not all that hard. All right, the sequencer has produced our first five minute sub. I'm just gonna go lie down for an hour and let it make about a dozen more subs. At which point I'll get up, run an autofocus routine, and as long as everything else is looking good, we'll carry on. All right, for the last couple hours, everything's going very well. We're mostly seeing our guiding bouncing between about 0.68 and 1.1 now that it's full dark. 
I'm pretty sure once I put a better guide scope on the telescope, we'll get improved guiding as well. And the guide scope I have up there right now is about the size of a pocket flashlight, 120 millimeters of focal length. And when you factor that in with the large pixel size of my guide camera, it's just frankly underpowered for this telescope. I do have a 50 millimeter aperture with a 200 millimeter focal length guide scope of very good quality arriving in a couple days. And when I put that on, I think we'll see consistently better performance. Time will tell, experimentation often defeats theory. It's really dark outside now and very clear. You can see the beautiful sub showing up in the imaging panel. But that's not why I came back on here. I want to take a moment to show you something very important about Nina's autofocus feature, something I don't see enough information on. Uh, let me just be frank. If you try to use the standard autofocus feature on a nebulous target, your autofocus is likely to fail. I've already started the autofocus subroutine. Watch what happens. Nina's standard autofocus routine, star HFR, is looking for nice round stars. And the presence of all the nebulous material in this image is really throwing it off. I've seen this effect consistently when I've tried to autofocus with nebulae in the image. So to use the autofocus feature when you have nebulous material in the image, you need to use another experimental feature of Nina that I find through experience works pretty well. Contrast detection. Rather than looking for tight round stars, contrast detection, as I understand it, looks at the whole scene by taking a series of photos and moving the autofocuser a little bit each time until it finds that image with the sharpest contrast. And that becomes a new focus point. It's fast and it works very well. To use it, you just have to pop into the options, go under the autofocus tab, and on the top right, change the autofocus step size to about one half of whatever you were using for the star HFR autofocus setting. You could, if you wanted, also set up the autofocus to take shorter exposures. I usually autofocus with only five to 10 second exposure, so I don't bother with that. I don't care if I lose a few seconds in an autofocus routine that I only run every hour or two anyway. Maybe I should worry more about it, but I mean, this can't be all work. It's gotta be fun too, right? So let's go ahead and run the contrast detection autofocus routine and see what happens. The contrast detection feature worked very quickly and set the focus, which is in my case a ZWO EAF autofocuser, at 5881 steps. We'll go ahead and run the sequencer, and as soon as we get a new image, we'll take a look at it and make sure that image meets our standards. All right, a fresh five minutes exposure is just about to pop up. We'll just go ahead and zoom in so we can take a good close look. Wow, that looks great. Beautiful sharp stars and a well-defined nebula. So just another little tip there. When shooting nebulae, stay away from star HFR and use the contrast detection feature. It works really well on nebulous targets. I don't know, if you have a different kind of camera, maybe it won't get the same results. I'm using a Player One Uranus C and I really find that this feature works with it beautifully in Nina. All right, tracking's running beautifully. Autofocus is running beautifully. I'm going to get some sleep for another hour or so, then get up and run another autofocus routine. And I'll do this till pretty much dawn. All right, it's dawn at the homestead. I've already gotten up, shot my biases and flats, and downloaded everything from the mini PC. And as you may have guessed, I've already processed it all using my favorite image processing software, Cyril, and also Affinity Photo. In a future video, we'll take a close look at how to stack and edit your images to get the most out of them. But for now, here's our image, the salt and pepper star cluster, and the beautiful, unforgettable bubble nebula. As always, I'd like to thank everybody who has subscribed to this channel and takes the time to watch these videos. Your participation means so much to me, 
I just got this channel going only about three months ago. We're already well over a thousand subscribers and still growing. And it's my hope to bring you the best channel possible on both astronomy and astrophotography. If you like the video, please take a moment to like, and I would sure appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. And if you have any thoughts, opinions, commentary, or just want to say something, by all means, please leave a comment below. Thank you from Cliff in the Canadian Backwoods.